The Dark Days. They are one of the most interesting parts of the Hunger Games series. It was a three year long war between the districts and the capital that led to the formation of the Hunger Games themselves. With the release of Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, we got our first look at these times on screen. So, I thought it was the perfect time to do a deep dive into the dark days of Pan Am. Fair warning, there will be spoilers for the opening scene of the movie, but most of what I'm going to go over was actually already shown in the trailer. So, I guess I'm giving a spoiler alert, but there's not really spoilers. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. It will greatly help the channel with the algorithm, meaning I can make more fun videos like this one. And if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button, and you can also follow me on all of my socials, all of which are linked down below, and all of which house similar content that I make here on this channel. Now that I've said that, let's get the video started. War. Terrible war. Widows, orphans, a motherless child. I guess I should start with the first rebellion. In what was formerly North America, the country of Pan Am was formed, and there, the capital, located in the Rocky Mountains, held the seat of power. They ruled over the 13 districts, each of which had an industry that gave the capital a very extravagant life. Meanwhile, even though the capital had the most advanced technology in the country as well as immense wealth, they shared almost none of that with the districts and allowed them to live in poverty while they lived in luxury. The districts eventually had enough of this, and they decided it was time to fight back against the capital, and this led to a three year long war. All 13 districts came together, and they built a strong rebel force to go against the capital. They started by fighting the peacekeepers that were stationed in their respective districts, and from there they started to make their way to the capital city. They used the resources each district had from their respective industries, most notably using District 13's nuclear weaponry. They also used District 5's bomb warning system, which was supposed to alert the capital of a coming attack, and the rebels toyed with the capital by sending fake warnings when nothing was really coming. The capital had to take these warnings seriously though, because they knew that District 13 really could bomb them. They went as far as to assign every citizen a bunker when those warnings came. This was a huge hit to the capital, as the rebels just kept sending fake warnings, making the capital go insane every time. This also made the capital unsure if a bombing really was coming or not, and once they got a bit complacent thinking that no bombs were coming, the rebels flew over and really did drop bombs on the city courtesy of District 13's arsenal. This led to buildings being destroyed, too many casualties to count, and destruction that the capital never thought the districts were capable of. The capital tried to be sneaky in the war as well, but their biggest plan actually completely backfired on them. They created birds called Jabberjays who repeated whatever they heard, which we actually saw in the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. The capital sent these birds to rebel strongholds to learn of their plans, but the rebels quickly caught on and started giving the birds false information. This made the capital look foolish, as they would arrive to raids that they had planned only to find nothing there, and other times they were led straight into a trap where they would be attacked by the rebels. Even 75 years later during the original series, this failed experiment was still an embarrassment for the capital. Though that plan failed though, the capital did have a few victories. At one point, they captured a fair few rebel leaders, and they executed them publicly in their arena. However, this led to the rebels retaliating by bombing the arena so they couldn't string their soldiers up there anymore. A few other capital successes were strategically placing the genetically enhanced tracker jacker nests around the districts, basically using them like landmines. However, again, the rebels adapted quickly, realizing that the tracker jackers could just be taken down with smoke. Eventually, the rebels made it to the capital, and there, they were a force to be reckoned with. The capital had strategically been placed inside of the Rocky Mountains though, meaning that the rebels would have to climb over to enter the city. Realizing that this was a huge feat, they found other ways to attack them. They shot down any capital ships that tried to enter the capital, and also any that tried to leave, ensuring that they couldn't get supplies or have one of their ships go out to retrieve supplies. The rebels did this for two years, and it had an awful effect on the capital. The capital citizens went from living in luxury to being in absolute hell. With the supplies being cut off, they had very little food, meaning that many died from starvation. They had all of their power cut off, meaning they had no heat or air conditioning. This led to people freezing to death or dying of heat exhaustion depending on the season. And as time went on, things got worse and worse until drug abuse became the only escape for people, leading to many overdoses. People became so desperate that they would start eating the people who died in the streets, which was of course what we saw in the opening scene of the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes movie. Coriolanus Snow saw this happen, and he was clearly very young during the dark days. At that young age, he witnessed things that would scar him for life. Obviously, we have the opening scene where he saw the man eating another man's leg, and this was even worse in the book, because in the book, 
he knew who that cannibal was. It was Nero Price, a family friend he had grown up being close to. Snow also saw a citywide epidemic of drug abuse, saw rats eating humans, sometimes while those humans were still alive, and at one point, he was even assaulted by a peacekeeper who was guarding the president's mansion, who also stole the little food he and his family had left. During those years in the dark days, Snow also fought off illness, and most of all, hunger, and that pain in his stomach that that would give him. The rebels were the clear leaders in the war, but there was a huge shift toward the end. This occurred when the rebels decided to invade the actual city. They finally decided to climb over the Rocky Mountains, and many died simply trying to make it over. This significantly weakened their forces, and things got even worse as they kept going. Once they were within range, the current president of Pan Am released the last remaining resources they had, sending airships to the rebels in the mountains. These airships quickly located them, and they did not hesitate to drop bombs on the rebels, killing the entire squad. This subsequently stopped the invasion and also turned the tide in the capital's favor. Shockingly, after seeing this, District 13 took matters into their own hands and betrayed the other 12 districts. Seeing that the rebels had all but lost, District 13 went to the capital with a proposal to ensure their own freedom. During this, they pointed every nuclear weapon that they had at the capital city, and they said that they would not hesitate to destroy them, even if it meant they would be destroyed as well. With no surprise, this got the capital's attention, and behind the back of the other 12 districts, District 13 proposed a ceasefire. This deal included allowing District 13 to be free from the country of Pan Am, free of the capital's rule, and avoid any punishment the other districts got. In return, District 13 would stop pointing their bombs at the capital, would withdraw from the war, which was a big deal seeing as they provided the bombs the rebels were using, and finally, District 13 said that the capital could use them as an example bombing their district. However, the entire population of 13 would be underground when this happened, protected from the nuclear strike. There, according to the deal, they would live out their days underground, being free from Pan Am and never revealing themselves to the other districts. The capital agreed to these terms, and they went ahead and bombed District 13 while all of its citizens were underground. They filmed this, and they showed this bombing footage to the other districts, and would continue to show it to them for the next 75 years, warning the other districts that this could be them too. The other districts, now severely undermanned after the failed invasion of the capital, pretty much weaponless without 13's bombs, and scared beyond belief that they would all die from a bombing, they waved the white flag and gave up. To end the war in the dark days, the capital put together what was called the Treaty of Treason. This detailed the district's punishment, that being the annual Hunger Games, where each district would be forced to give up one boy and one girl every year to fight to the death in an arena. It also said that the dark days must never be repeated, and said that the districts would have little to no contact with each other moving forward, ensuring they didn't try another uprising. This put the capital back in the seat of power, and they now had more control over the districts than ever before. As for 13, their hope was that they would simply die off when left on their own, the capital not even considering them a threat anymore. The capital also tried to change history. They started telling the rest of the country that District 13's industry was graphite mining, not nuclear weaponry, which surprisingly eventually caught on, Katniss and the other characters in the original series fully believing this. We know of course that what the capital had hoped was happening with District 13 was not what was happening. 13 took decades to become stronger and build their arsenal, and for 75 years, they got ready to take Pan Am back and free the 12 districts that they had originally betrayed. And that is everything that we know about the Dark Days. It was fun to take all the bits and pieces that each book gave us about the Dark Days and put it together into one cohesive story. Again, I think this is one of the most interesting and fascinating parts of the Hunger Games series, and I don't see a lot of people talking about it. So in the comments below, let me know what you thought of the Dark Days. What are your thoughts? What are your takeaways? I'm excited to read your thoughts. That's all I have for you guys today though, so I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life, like my cute dog Loki, and some behind the scenes movie flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me, and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe, and look out for more great Movie Flame videos on the way.